Go for it. Yeah, so my name is Lauren and I'd like to, uh, I'm really appreciative to be part of this workshop. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about something very different uh, than some of the talks that you've heard about earlier. Uh, we're going to talk about integrating RNA-seq and chromatin accessibility uh, for genome-wide expression analysis. And um, I did my PhD in developmental biology. So yes, I'm very interested in human disease, but I love to, you know, bring my development background into the study of cardiovascular disease. Um, I did my PhD in Xenopus development. So uh, again, not a, not a human um, system. And so I understand some of your uh, struggles, I guess, with sequencing data with uh, non, um, not human organisms. So, okay. So as was alluded to, I'm actually very interested in chromatin remodeling. Um, and this is because patients who have congenital heart disease have a burden of mutations in chromatin remodeling genes. Um, and to me, this is really fascinating because chromatin remodeling genes are ubiquitously expressed in many different cell types and tissue types. And so why do they have this very particular phenotype? Um, chromatin remodeling proteins are proteins that are important for DNA packaging, uh, which is crucial for expression of gene regulation. So I'm going to show you here just a breakdown of uh, what chromatin looks like uh, in schematic form. Here we have our chromosome uh, that, if you zoom in a little bit more, is made up of uh, chromatin fibers the building blocks of which are nucleosomes. And DNA is wrapped around uh, a nucleosome at 146 base pairs. Um, so a nucleosome contains uh, four histone proteins with DNA wrapped around it. And so if we unwind these nucleosomes, we get our naked uh, DNA. And so what this another example of what this looks like, so chromatin can either be um, open or closed. And it seems like uh, in my transferring over some of my my text boxes got moved, so I apologize for that. But DNA that is closed um, is wrapped very tightly around the nucleosome and cannot physically be um, bound to by Paul II, for example. Um, and so we have gene silencing and no transcription. Uh, conversely, if chromatin is open, it can be um, amenable to uh, ex uh, changes like being bound by Paul II. Um, having histone methylation, uh, changes in histone methylation status. Um, we can see, so these two marks here, Paul 2 and H3K4 trimethyl are marks of transcriptional activation. We also have other marks that are important um, and are kind of uh, designated to be enhancer marks like H3K4 monomethyl or H3K27 acetyl. Open chromatin can also be um, modified by transcription factor binding. So if transcription factors can physically bind to this space, um, as well as then um, looping can be, or chromatin can be uh, modified by something called TAD formation. I'll talk about that later. And that's marked by CTCF being bound to particular regions of chromatin. Um, so actually I gave this primer last year about kind of how how these techniques and technologies work um, kind of in a practical sense and how we might use them to analyze and, and address interesting biological questions. So I'm actually going to talk um, more practically, I think, than, or more technically than some of the other talks. Um, I'm going to talk about ATAC-seq, CHIP-seq, and hi -C, um, three different kinds of chromatin landscape data that you can use independently, or uh, they have much more power when utilized together. So ATAC-seq is a, is a methodology that is relatively new. Um, it started in 20, it was first published in 2015, and it's now um, many, many publications, including this one in 2017, have pushed the field forward. And ATAC-seq is a technique that is used to look for regions of chromatin that are open. So how it works is uh, from cells or nuclei, you have you know, regions of chromatin that are open and open, and regions of chromatin that are not. And so you have this TN5 transposase, that will integrate into regions that are open. And upon integration, we'll cleave pieces of DNA that are open. We can then isolate these regions. Um, the transposase has an adapter on it as well. So you can, you can isolate these and then um, uh, amplify them, make a library and sequence them. The huge benefit of ATAC-seq is that you can do it in a very small amount of cells, about 50 to 100,000 cells. Um, it takes about three to four hours to do, so it's like one day in the wet lab, um, plus the time for sequencing and analysis, which obviously takes more time, um, especially 
for someone like me who started out as a wet lab biologist and then had to learn computational tools to, to be able to analyze this data. Um, what's also really nice is that this technique can be for, performed on fresh or frozen cells or tissue. Um, and the resolution here of sequencing is at the nucleosome level. So I mentioned um, uh, DNA wrapped around a nucleosome is 146 base pairs. So uh, what uh, an ATAC-seq library might look like is something like this. This is a tape station um, for four different samples. This is an electronic DNA ladder. And what you would hope to see in a library prep for ATAC-seq is kind of this ladder-like striated banding pattern um, that is about 146 base pairs each. Um, you get a kind of a smear, you know, that you don't necessarily have successful integration of the transposase within open chromatin. So this is kind of what you would look for uh, if you were doing this experiment. Another different type of experiment to look at regions of open DNA that is bound by a transcription factor would be ChIP-seq. Um, and I, this is a technique that a lot of you are probably more familiar with. Um, it's, a, it's an older technique, uh, but it actually answers a different biological question. So while ATAC is looking for all the regions of DNA that are open, ChIP-seq is looking for regions of DNA that are bound by a particular protein of interest. So I'm showing you here by schematic. Um, this is gonna be a protein that's bound to your particular piece of DNA. Um, so how this works technically is you would cross-link your cells, sonicate chromatin and immunoprecipitate. Um, and the primer was actually about some kind of troubleshooting and, and quality control. Um, and I find I spent probably about a year optimizing and troubleshooting these techniques and technologies. Uh, so I felt like I have to share with people who are potentially trying this for the first time, right? So I think the most important thing for uh, doing chip seek experiments, the first thing would be the cross-linking. So overfixing cells would lead to chromatin that is too big. If your chromatin is too big, you actually don't necessarily know where your protein is bound if you get a huge region of DNA, right? Um, so then you sonicate your chromatin into a small manageable size, about 200 to 600 base pairs. Um, and this should be determined experimentally with different aliquots of cells if, you, if you're fortunate enough to have excess sample. Um, and then thirdly, the immunoprecipitation step, uh, the antibody specificity is very important. So if you have a, you need a good antibody to be able to do a chip seek. Otherwise your data is gonna look really dirty and it doesn't really give you the information that you need. This technique um, can be done on 10 to 30 million cells. It's gonna depend on how abundant your protein of interest is, right? So um, actually let me take a step back. There's an immunoprecipitation step here and there's two kind of classes of chip seek that you can do. One is a transcription factor or a, a protein a chip seek where you're gonna pull out using an antibody this particular protein that's found in DNA. The other kind of common chip seek methodology that people use are for H, uh, histone modifications on um, uh, the histone isomers that make up part of the nucleosome. So this is kind of a histone uh, chip. These are much easier. These antibodies are much better. Um, these are a little bit harder to do. So what happens in when you immunoprecipitate, you're gonna pull out your protein of interest and the DNA that it's bound to because we, we have cross-linked our cells. We would then reverse the cross-links, purify the DNA and sequence them. Uh, this should be done, this is a, you need 10 to 30 million cells to do this instead of ATAC, which was much fewer because this is dependent on how abundant your protein is, right? So if you have a histone protein here that's really highly expressed, you can get away with doing it less. But if you're looking at a cardiac transcription factor, for example, uh, you're gonna need a lot more cells than expression. Uh, this technique takes a little bit longer, it takes about a week, I would say, plus sequencing and analysis. Um, the cells are usually fixed before freezing, so that's kind of a, a limitation. Um, you have to fix the tissue fresh. Um, and the resolution here is going to be dependent on your sharing size, which is going to be different from ATAC on the previous slide. So here's an example of just some quality control. Again, um, here we actually, I'm, I'm controlling for sharing time. Um, and so here I took four different, uh, well, four of the same aliquots of cells and I shared them for four different times, four minutes, seven minutes, 10 minutes, and 13 minutes. And as you can see, um, we do see a, a, a smearing pattern like you're supposed to, but we also see this very large region of chrom um, genomic DNA, unsheared genomic DNA at the top. And then, for example, what I did here, for the after was uh, had to troubleshoot a whole bunch of buffer conditions and cell size and things like that. So the first time you kind of troubleshoot your chromatin, you kind of sometimes will get a, a gel that looks like this, but then after a year of troubleshooting, you're hoping to see um, four 
kind of uh, lanes that kind of look like this. They have, you see a range of about 200 to 600 base pairs. Okay. So I told you before kind of how, you know, the point of using of ATAC seq versus chip seq. Um, when it comes to the library prep, though, the, the techniques and the technologies are very similar. So um, here I'm just showing you kind of uh, after library prep. Um, I'm sorry. Here's the library prep step. So basically, for DNA, for ATAC seq and for chip seq, this is very similar. So ATAC seq, these primers uh, or this region, these regions of DNA, we're going to have the uh, adapters. Um, we're going to PCR amplify them with index primers. Uh, we're going to then sequence. For chip, it's going to be very similar. There's no adapters already, but we're going to add adapters via a library prep, PCR amplify, and sequence. So now we've got our sequences. Uh, the first thing we want to do is align to the genome. Here I use BWA and MEM. Um, we have to sequence at a different resolution for ATAC versus ChIP-seq. ATAC seq, you need about 50 million reads per sample, whereas chip seq, you only need about 20 to 30 million reads per sample. Once you align to the genome, then we have some computational things that we need to do. Um, first, we want to remove PCR duplicates that are that kind of come up in this step here at the library prep step. Um, and as a quality control here, if you have too many PCR duplicates, it means that your library was over amplified or not complex enough. So you've done too many cycles and you have too many PCR duplicates. The next step of quality control here would be to remove mitochondrial DNA. Um, this is especially important for the ATAC-seq protocol. Um, the ATAC-seq protocol requires that you make nuclei, and so there shouldn't be mitochondrial contamination in your nuclei. However, sometimes uh, having too much mitochondrial means that your cells are dying or damaged. Um, and actually, a later version of the ATAC-seq protocol called Omni-ATAC brings your mitochondrial DNA contamination from like 80% before to about 10 to 15%. Um, so if you guys want to do ATAC-seq, I highly recommend uh, the course says paper from 2017 that describes a new tech, uh, new buffer conditions and things like that, that really um, will scale down the mitochondrial contamination. So once we do these quality control steps, a lot of the downstream analysis is very similar. So we'll align, we've aligned the reads, we've removed some of the um, potential contaminants, and then we'll call peaks. Um, and then we'll annotate. So we can annotate either your open chromatin regions for ATAC, or protein bound rich regions for chip. And while I just said that peak calling is, is, is similar, it's not exactly the same. So for, um, I'm showing you here how we would call peaks for ATAC seq on the top and chip seq peaks on the bottom. For an ATAC seq, we actually don't have any input sequence to compare to, right? So we're just sequencing all of the regions that are open. Um, whereas in chip seq down here, you actually, in addition to providing your chip seq um, uh, sample, you will also provide an input sample where you just give them chromatin that hasn't been um, subjected to amino precipitation. So this is kind of your background reads. And you're looking for enrichment of your chip seq reads over input. So these are two kind of very different um, approaches to uh, calling peaks. To kind of account for there not being an input sample here, what we use uh, instead is called local filtering, what we call peaks. So instead of comparing to an input, what you would do is you would compare all the region, the reads here to kind of all the reads within a certain distance of this sequence. So you would compare this to reads over here, reads over here, reads over here. You would say, okay, this sequence here is enriched for uh, open chromatin versus kind of the local chromatin environment. For ATAC-seq, peaks can be either broad or narrow. So here's an example of a broad peak. Here's an example of a narrow peak. And um, a broad peak would be more likely to be found at a promoter. So regions of DNA that are very, very open, like being act genes being actively transcribed uh, at promoter regions. Whereas these kind of narrower peaks are usually because they're being found by a single transcription factor or a single complex, they're more likely to be in cancer sequences. Um, the same is true for chip seq as well. So peaks can either be broad and they're more likely to be broad if for like a histone modification factor. Um, or, but if you're looking again at a transcription factor chip seq peak, the peaks would look more like this. ATAC seq, um, because you sequence deeper, 
um, you usually get more peaks because you're also looking at all the regions that are open, right? Not specific to one particular protein. So in theory, if you sequence deep enough, an ATAC seq would encompass every single chip seq um, and, and then some, right? So this is kind of more broad uh, and this is gonna be more specific. Okay. So this is kind of a real life example of what this looks like. Um, I, again, I work in a cardiovascular uh, development and disease lab. And so we use the IPS cell model to study uh, mutations in chromatin remodeling proteins. And so we do this in an IPS cell differentiation model that takes 30 days. So day zero is the IPS cell stage. Day four is a cardiac mesoderm stage. Day eight is a cardiac progenitor stage. And day 30, we actually see these cells will spontaneously contract in culture. So they're, they're um, relatively mature beating cardiomyocytes. So I'm showing you here the top four um, rows. This is an IGB view. Um, IGB is the software from the road that is used to, to look at some of these, these um, types of data. And as you can see here, these are um, there's a lot going on at this GATA4 gene, which is a gene that's known to be expressed um, in the developing heart. And so you can see and you can compare over time um, differences in open chromatin regions. So for example, uh, GATA4, uh, the region of chromatin is very much open here and it kind of closes over time. Down here is uh, an example of what some chip seek data would look like. Uh, you can see right away that some of the chip seek for a histone binding protein will result in kind of shorter and broader peaks. Um, and then this is kind of a poised enhancer mark, whereas H3K27 is a mark for, for active, um, active enhancer activity. So you can see these peaks are much higher in a gene that's being actively expressed at this stage. So just uh, one more thing for the quality control for what these peaks should look like. They should actually look like peaks, right? Because you're, you're, you're aligning these peaks, to the, these reads to the genome. Theoretically, the most kind of the center of your peak is where your, your protein is bound. Um, and they shouldn't look like squares. If they look like squares, when you do this, it's usually a PC, kind of a PCR duplicate. If you get the exact same read many, many times over time, right? Um, that's generally a problem with your, your experimental, uh, something in the wet lab, basically, or you didn't remove your PCR duplicate. So they should kind of have this nice um, peak-like distribution. So yeah. All right, so we've done, we've assayed for open chromatin, we've assayed for regions of the genome that are bound by a transcription factor. We have these peaks and what do they mean? Um, what is the nearest gene? What is this peak associated with, right? So um, it's still kind of a, a contentious question and it shouldn't be, um, at least computationally. So many annotation tools when you're trying to annotate your, your peaks use what's called the nearest gene method. And I'm just gonna show you here what this might look like. So here are your peaks. Here are, the, are the, the genes across the genome. So the transcriptional start and the transcriptional end um, for three different genes or loci, right? If you just assign a peak to a nearest gene, this one here would be associated with the blue gene, right? And then, you know, maybe this one here would be associated with the yellow gene. And this one here uh, would probably be associated with the red gene if we're looking at the, the distance to the, the beginning of the nearest gene. However, there are other tools. Uh, so this could be misleading because binding sites may be located between two tar start sites of two different genes. Um, it also selects against peaks in large genes, right? If you have a large intron and you have a peak in like intron two of a large gene, physically speaking, it might actually be closer to the transcriptional start site of like an, an encoded long non-coding RNA. Um, so there are a lot of tools out there to try and figure out how best to assign and annotate peaks. Um, so while we can sometimes look at nearest gene, there are other programs that look at the distance from uh, the, the nearest transcriptional start site. Um, so that would change some kind of the annotation of some of these peaks. So for example, this one was assigned to a nearest gene body of blue. However, physically, it's actually closer to the promoter of this gene over here. So this could be, you know, kind of downstream of blue gene, but it also could be a couple of KB upstream of the yellow gene, right? So it's just something to take into consideration. And especially um, if you're looking at other people's manuscripts and trying to get their gene lists, it's just something to keep in mind. Um, 
And there are programs that do both. I prefer um, one where we assign, um, it, it, there's this package called Chip Seeker used in R that it's used to annotate genes. It's based on the nearest gene method, but you can actually provide it parameters to specify a maximum distance from your transcriptional start site. So like you can say, oh, if it's more than 30 kV above the transcriptional start site, it's probably not associated with the gene. So since some annotations overlap, Chip Seeker will prioritize promoter sequences and then um, sequences within the gene body first. So again, if it's in kind of the intron, the intron seven of a large gene, but it's closer to the promoter of a different gene, it's going to call it um, associated with the promoter gene versus the very, um, the intronic gene. Um, and this is kind of an example of what this might look like. So if you, when you annotate, so it'll, you can give it a peak list um, and it will, it will specify based on distance from the transcriptional start site. And it will give you this nice bar chart to look, you know, for regions of the genome. So, for example, in this ATAC seq data set, about 50% of the peaks are associated right at the transcriptional start site. And that's pretty normal for an ATAC seq. So, CHIP and ATAC um, are two methods that kind of ask two different but complementary questions, right? What regions are open and then what regions are bound by a transcription factor? Um, a lot of times what you will do is you'll do an ATAC seq, which is kind of a broad screen, and then the reviewers will come back and ask you, okay, well, this region of chromatin is open, but what, what's happening at that region? So a lot of the times what happens is you'll take an ATAC seq, you'll look for transcriptional binding motifs that are enriched within your peaks. Um, and for example, if we had a, this peak here is open, and if we were to do a motif analysis, you would say, okay, at this region, the GATA motif is, is enriched at that peak. What you can then do is take some chip seek data and overlay where GATA6, for example, is bound in, the, in the, a similar cell type and say, okay, this region is open and GATA6 is bound at this particular region. So um, we can overlap these two data sets using a, a computational tool called bed tools. It's actually a very simple uh, command for even for me, who's not a computational biologist. Uh, it's just one line. So you would intersect um, these two um, bed files. A bed file is, uh, is, a, is a peak file list. And then you would get a region, the regions that intersect. So the intersection file would look at something, it'll, it'll say, okay, well, this region overlaps, this region kind of overlaps, this one does not. So it would output it into a separate file for you. And then you can get the regions that are both open and bound by your transcription factor of interest. And again, I've always been very interested in chromatin. You can take a look at ATAC and chip seek data all day and say, okay, this region is open. If it's bound by a transcription factor, does it have any effect on transcription whatsoever? Um, is the gene misexpressed? What's happening at the transcriptional level? Um, and so most of the time what happens is you do a, an epigenetics or a chip ATAC set of experiments and then people go, okay, how does it change transcription? So you usually have to then do RNA seq on these same samples. Um, and overlap these data sets together. And um, to do that, it's actually a, another quite simple command. Um, R is a, the programming kind of language that bioinformaticians use nowadays. Um, in addition to Python, R is free and open source, and I imagine you guys will be using it to analyze some of your RDC data. Uh, there's this command that I didn't learn about until uh, much later than I should have, so I'm going to tell you all about it right now. Um, it's this command called in, and it takes one list and will tell you all of the things, all of the genes that are in another list. So it's just, a, it's like a super simple, if you have a data frame or a list of genes from RNA-seq and a list of genes from ChIP-seq, you would say, okay, in the RNA gene list, which RNA, uh, which of these are in your ChIP-seq list? And then you'll get a list of overlapping genes. You don't have to do anything manually. It's incredible. Um, if you wanna look for ones that are unique to a particular list, all you would have to do is add this exclamation point. So in computer programming, an exclamation point means not. So now you're saying of the genes in the RNA gene list, which of these are not in a ChIP-seq gene list? And then you'll get the genes that are unique to RNA-seq. Another thing to note too, is that um, capitalization and, and um, typing is key. 
So a lot of times I'll get questions about, or I'll be asked to compare human and mouse data. And those are not annotated in the same way, right? Human genes are all capitalized and mouse uh, genes are usually just have the first letter capitalized. Those are not the same. If you try to overlap them, that won't work. There are commands in, in R that you can use to change all of these to capital or vice versa. But um, if you try and do it without um, changing the cap space, I don't remember what that term is called. These two things are not equal. So if you try to overlap them, it won't work. I'm going to talk about one more kind of less commonly used way to overlap some of this integration data or some overlap some of this data. Um, and that's high C or chrom uh, chromosome conformational capture. So any kind of C, 4C, 3C, 5C. Um, it's going to be, a, it's, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, it's a way to look at really long range genetic inter um, chromatin interactions. So this is a technique where you cross-link your chromatin network. Um, you will then restriction enzyme uh, digest this very large kind of three-dimensional structure. You'll then biotinylate these spaces, uh, the ends, ligate them together, pull them down by a streptavidin, um, which recognizes this biotinylated um, label, make a sequencing library and deep sequence. And it's gonna be kind of similar to the, the splicing um, sequencing, right? So regions of an intron that are, or regions of, of, of an RNA that are spliced out, you're gonna have the sequences that look like this. But if they're not, um, you're gonna have a different kind of uh, type of read. So here, what I'm showing you is the red and the blue are in different three-dimensional, or three different two-dimensional spaces. But in a three-dimensional space, they're close together. And because we cross-link them together, we can say, okay, this region of DNA is touching this one. When we sequence it, we can capture those reads. Um, this is a very long process. Um, you need a lot of you need a lot of cells, um, and you also have to. Th this process takes much longer, so it's probably more like a week um, plus sequencing plus analysis. The cells have to be cross-linked before frozen, and this is a uh, in very different from chip and ATAC. It's that it's at a very low resolution. Um, about five to 10 KB, whereas ATAC or CHIP was on the order of hundreds of base pairs. Um, the other very different thing about high C is that you actually need a, you have to sequence very, very deeply to capture all of these three dimensional chromatin interactions. You need about a billion reads per sample, um, which is a lot and it's very expensive. Uh, the computational analysis is also going to be a little bit different. So we have our cross, this is just a different kind of semantic. We have our cross-linked chromatin that we've re-ligated regions that were kind of touching. We sequence and we align to a reference. Um, some aligners are better than others at aligning high C reads. And so if you want to do a high C um, and a chip and an ATAC, it's kind of good to know that ahead of time. So you can align to the same, you can use the same aligner to align your, your sequences to the genome. And there are a lot of pipelines that do a good job helping align these sequences to the genome. The one I recommend is called Juicer. Um, and what it does is it will, you see here, you're aligning to the reference genome. And again, these reads in, in when you align them are really far apart, right? Um, so it actually will try and break them up into this side of the read and this side of the read. Um, and then it will kind of computationally put them back together after the fact. You then get these paired read files that you can then view using uh, computational tools like Juicer. This is what this looks like. Um, so what I'm showing you here is called a, a basically it's two sets of tags, topologically associated domains. And what this show is showing you is regions of DNA that are interacting with each other. So a region here that's red. Um, so it's actually in a two dimensional space. So it looks like this. And so it's actually cut in half. So regions here um, that are red on this axis interact with uh, reads on this axis. So these red regions are regions that are more likely to be associated with each other. Whereas regions that are like this almost never interact with each other. And so, you know, we have these large kind of regions that 
interact with one another, but not with another tad. So this, this kind of tad here will have a lot of um, interaction within itself, but not necessarily with the tad next door. This is often associated with the localization of CTCF, which is a, is a, a, a protein that is found at TAD boundaries. So if you overlap ChIP-seq for CTCF here, you'll see it found at these TAD boundaries. And then genes within these TADs are more likely to interact with each other, but not, not, not anyone else. And so TADs, uh, so this high C data can show you both long range interactions, you know, this could be mega bases apart, as well as short range interactions. And if we integrate it with the CTCF, you can then begin to, to kind of get a greater understanding of, you know, these CTCF binding have to be in a certain orientation. And it gives you kind of a more comprehensive analysis of maybe why, you know, an open chromatin, re all the regions in this TAD are open and all of this one, these ones are closed, for example. Um, so you can get a lot of information from this kind of analysis. So I'm gonna give you one real life example of, of integrating all of these analyses together to look to get a, a, bit, a better understanding of gene regulation and things like that. So um, I published this paper last year in eLife on the transcription factor GATA6, which is a gene that's been known to be associated with congenital heart disease. And Kind of the, we, we saw changes, we, first thing we did was RNA-seq and we looked at changes in gene expression. And we saw some really interesting findings about how a patient, um, we made a, an iPS cell model for a, missense, a patient missense mutation and we were comparing wild type and um, this patient missense mutation. And we saw some really interesting findings in the RNA-seq data, but we were also a little bit confused about, you know, uh, Kind of why some of these transcriptional pathways were being misregulated. And so we went back and did some, some epigenetics data and because we found that we, we knew that GATA, GATA factors in general are called what's called pioneer factors. And pioneer factors are factors that will bind to closed chromatin, recruit a chromatin remodeler to open the chromatin and change gene expression. We knew that GATA's, GATA factors could do this, but we didn't know if GATA6 could do this, and we didn't know if GATA6 could do this in the context of cardiovascular development. So I performed GATA6 ChIP-seq and GATA6 ATEC-seq in wild type and, and all of the mutants. Um, I'm only showing you here uh, some of the wild type data, just as an example. But we found that if we overlay these data, um, this is again in schematic form, GATA6 was found to be close predominantly, GATA6 was found to be bound to predominantly to closed chromatin. So 88% of the time we would see a GATA6 chip C peak, but no ATEC C peak there. And at first I was like, well, maybe, you know, maybe my antibody's garbage, right? Maybe, you know, there's, there could be a, a number of different reasons that this could be. Um, however, when we, but GATA6 was bound to open chromatin, it was associated with its known DNA binding location. I also did this in a homozygous mutant, not homozygous null mutant. And I didn't get any peaks. So I was like, okay, well, at least these the, the antibody specific to, to GATA6 because we don't get anything in the null. Why is GATA6 bound to closed chromatin? And what effect does this have on transcription, right? If it's closed, wouldn't you think that, that um, uh, these genes would not be being regulated? But the pioneerness of a pioneer factor is that uh, it will bind to closed chromatin, it will recruit a chromatin remodeler, it will open the chromatin and turn on the gene at a, a, a time point, you know, later in time. And so then I looked at back at the RNA-seq at day four and at day five of differentiation, and we found that there were a lot of genes that were bound by GATA6 at closed chromatin that were off. But just 24 hours later, uh, a significant portion of those genes had been turned on. So this, are, we concluded from this that GATA6 was a pioneer factor potentially for cardiac development. And we would have never kind of known that had we not been able to integrate all these different kinds of data sets together. We would have just said, oh, at this stage of development, there's massive transcriptional changes, which is true, but it's because GATA6 is binding, you know, we were able to kind of make this pioneer argument because we had all of these data sets together. Okay, so to summarize, each of our data sets can provide one piece to a puzzle. ATAXI can tell you all of the regions that are open. 
Chip C can tell you all the places that a protein is bound. High C can tell you all the places, the long range place, um, places where chromatin interacts with each other. And of course, RNA-C tells you uh, what the downstream effect on gene expression is. However, you know, the power lies with integrating all of this data together and integrating these data sets can provide a greater understanding of gene regulation. Um, so that's all I have to say today. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my PIs, John and Cricket, uh, as well as the informatics squad. Again, I come from a development background, but now I'm almost purely computational and I spend a lot of time thinking about chromatin remodeling in open regions of DNA and how they affect transcription. Um, so I'd like to thank my advisors as well as the, the other members of my team, and I'd be happy to take questions.